services for seniors. In addition, we uh, publish a newsletter. I do a website. We have a TV program. Our host is standing over there. Uh, we uh, participated in ARPA funding, the, uh, the COVID-related funds that were available, and we did our best to get our more than our fair share of it. In addition, I haven't done two misspellings here. One is ARPA and the other is AARP. Uh, since 2012, Brookline Can has been a World Health Organization age-friendly city. The ARPA, AARP, sorry, I mixed that up again, uh, it also sponsors an age-friendly cities program and we have just been approved by the Board of Selectmen to submit our application to become an AARP. City. Now, wouldn't you like to be part of that? <laughs> and you can. Uh, we have a very low membership fee. People are asking, why, what are, are we like a, uh, a, a senior village? 
who typically have uh, fees in the in the area of hundreds of dollars a year. Ours is 35. So if you can afford it, and we also have a discount membership if you can't afford $35, we'll, we'll uh, allow you to become a member in it at a lower rate, lower price. And we'd love to have all of you do that so that we continue this kind of work. If you'd like to do more and volunteer some time, we like those people too. We need those people. We do things like advocacy and outreach. This is the LCAC that I talked about earlier and other various programs. Uh, you saw a picture of the bench earlier. Uh, that's not a recent accomplishment, but that's the accomplishment primarily of Frank Carroll by himself, who in every meeting with a town official who had anything to do with benches, said we needed them between the big shopping districts. So that people who were going between Washington Square and Curtis of Coolidge Corner had a place to sit. And after years of asking quietly but persistently, he got them. We do websites, social media. We do, we have a very active communications committee does writing and editing and puts out a monthly newsletter along with press releases and that kind of thing. Uh, our education committee does program and event planning. And we have a membership committee that is involved in recruiting and training new members. Uh, if you want to be involved in any of that, come see any of us. We'll try to find a place that, make, that makes use of your skills, give you a place to socialize, and gives you something to do that makes you, uh, gives you satisfaction. Thanks, Jordan. Brookline Can is pleased to present to the 
Brookline Council on Aging Senior Center, the 2023 Frank Carroll Award for Community Service. And I would like Yolanda to come up to stand with me. The Council on Aging Senior Center not only helped older adults survive the COVID-19 pandemic, but also thrived. They were forced to shut their doors on March 13, 2020. I think we can all remember that day. And they had to pivot to online programs, providing older adults with information and resources and with essential services. By June of 220, the Senior Center reopened its doors for transportation, food, podiatry, and social work services. Brookline Can and the whole community appreciates the effort and hard work of the council, that the Council on Aging and Senior Center did to ease the burden of the pandemic. Yolanda Rodriguez, the Chair of the Council on Aging, will receive the award. This is a beautiful place. Yes. It is a privilege to pick this up for the Senior Center and the Council on Aging. It's a great honor. And I think, you know, there's before COVID and after COVID, and I'm very old, but I've never seen a time like this COVID time has been. And it brought out so much in everybody and so much health, so much good, so much caring, so much thoughtfulness. The Senior Center and the Council on Aging, we are blessed with a fantastic staff and volunteers. This award really wouldn't, wouldn't be able to be given to us had it not been for this outstanding staff who right away from the very beginning together with all of the volunteers who were willing to show up and mask and everything else, were able to get this wonderful center open again, stand out in the cold in the winter, giving out the grab and go lunches. Uh, I saw them so often. And when it came time to, come to connect and make, make it possible for people through Zoom and other things, to connect to each other, to not be completely isolated, the staff and the volunteers came through. Uh, they even taught me how to do Zoom. I can't imagine how, but they did. And I just thank you so much for honoring them because they really, really, really are a gift to the town and to all of us. They really care and they work so hard for us really appreciate you a great deal. Thank you very much. She's had a bigger impact on all of us than anybody I've met in this town. So uh, please, Ruth Ann would like to present uh, an award. Want me to say something about Frank Caro and that, which I wasn't prepared uh, 
but we are naming our awards after our beloved and dedicated founder and co-chair, Frank Cara. It was Frank, along with me, who began Brookline Can well over 12 years ago now uh, to empower and advocate and connect the seniors with their town government and make Brookline an even better place to live and grow old. We've achieved so much over the years. We, we lost Frank in 2020, and we're still feeling that loss. So it is with great honor and privilege that we're naming the 2023 and forevermore the Frank Caro Partnership Community Award. And it is my honor to present the second community, Frank Carroll Community Partnership Award to Kathy Barnes. Kathy has worked with Jewish Family and Children's Services for 16 years before she retired a year ago, September. Kathy is a remarkable person. Jewish Family and Children's Services received a grant for aging at home in this neighborhood. The neighborhood also contained Frank and Carol Caro's home. And the program was important in connecting seniors with aging at home, concierge, resources, social connection. And Frank immediately said, let's not limit it to one neighborhood. There's a need in this community to grow senior services, empower the whole community to advocate and to bring in new volunteers constantly in need to work on these issues. So Kathy, representing Jeff, Jeff and CS, Jewish Family and Children's Services, um, started the conversation and became part of the steering committee and worked so closely with Brookline Can over that 12 year period. Kathy is an individual who brings so much to the table. She is passionate about gerontology and aging at home and healthy aging. She has an incredible commitment to diversity, inclusion, and collaboration. She brings a deep dedication to volunteerism and working with older people and making those connections. Her creativity and intelligence brings much to any discussion or program. And most of all, Kathy is a doer. She would roll up her sleeves, make sure that program books got written and produced, that JF and CS, CS put their money where their mouth is with grants back to Brookline Can to fund projects with Brookline Housing Authority in order to improve public walkways, pedestrian safety issues to create art projects during COVID and post-COVID, so Brookline Housing Authority residents and Brookline Senior Center could have more art activities. All of this came through Kathy's dedication, and it is with great honor and privilege that we honor her with the 2023 Frank Caro Community Park.
which honors those businesses in town that have made a commitment and continue to make a commitment to be age friendly. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. It is so wonderful for me to receive a award that's in Frank's honor. He uh, was a mentor for me and one of the, the finest human beings I've ever known in terms of his dedication and his understated efforts to promote the well-being of older adults in Brooklyn. So, I owe him an incredible debt of gratitude, as I do to Ruthann and all of my colleagues uh, on, that are part of Brookline Can. And um, I thank you so much for this honor. I didn't break it. A bit. <laughs> I, uh, I just was glad that uh, Frank Carroll also brought me into the organization as he did many, many other people. Acted as a mentor to to many of us and, and most of us who, who uh, joined the organization. He was the center, uh, the center, and and the prime mover, and uh, we miss him all. We all miss him. But I'm glad. Uh, I'd love to see this award going out each year people who uh, follow in that, those kinds of footsteps and do things. Um, okay, now for the uh, uh, two speeches. We have uh, the first one is Sagal Reese, the Director of the Public Health and Human Services. Sagal uh, has been here more than a year now. I used to say she's new, not any longer. She can't get away with that. <laughs> But uh, she's, um, as you know, she's uh, the director of public health and human services. But she's also here to discuss how our community steps forward out of the pandemic and moves forward uh, considering the place we're at now. Masks or not. Thank you, Matt, for welcoming me. Welcoming me when I did come to the Brookline. You were a great friendly face, and I enjoyed uh, coming on your show. And congratulations to the awardees. It's great to hear about that. Um, every day I learn more and more about Brookline, and I'm going to milk that new thing as long as I can. It's been about a year and a half, but I still feel like I'm new, and I'm learning so much every day about Brookline. So. Thank you again for having me today. I'm going to talk about public health and the pandemic and the impacts on older adults and how we reemerge, which is the theme of tonight. Public health is a discipline that's really focused on the we and the us rather than the individual. It looks at systems in our communities and institutions that lead to better or worse health outcomes. Um, number one indicator of your health is not your genetics or the health care you receive, it's actually your zip code. It's where you live, what conditions you live in, and what we call the social determinants of health. And social determinants of health are social, economic, environmental factors that affect the collective health and well-being of community members. These factors may include things like education, employment, housing, safety, social connections, and transportation. A lot of things we talk about in this building here. In turn, these, factor, these factors influence social structures and systems, including economic inequality, uh, structural racism, historical and current discrimination, and other forms of injustice. Your ability to access protective social determinants like healthy housing are determined by root causes in hierarchies of privilege, such as race, wealth, and age. An example, something we see unfortunately in our community, examples could be older adult looking for housing and the landlord prefers a younger tenant due to stigma, ageism, and ableism. Access to safe and suitable housing can limit someone's ability to age, um, and it's the equity and structural systems that provide some people with privileges and others with disadvantages. It is the imbalance that leads to health inequities. 
public health works to address these inequities and strives for health equity. Health equity means creating conditions of optimal health, more than just your physical health, but also your emotional and your current, um, your cultural well-being, not only the absence of disease. And in order to optimize health equity, we must look at three things. Number one, we must address uh, power imbalances, recognize and identify how structural racism and other isms um, have created historical and current injustices which lead to inequalities. And three, break down the structures and create new ones rooted in equity, community power, and community strength and assets. Get that as a basis of our approach and how we look at systems in our community. As we all know here, we've talked a lot about the COVID pandemic has been one of the most challenging and devastating events in recent history. It has affected millions of lives around the world, causing illness, death, economic hardship, and social disruption. But among all the groups that have been impacted by the pandemic, one of the most vulnerable is the older adult population. Older adults are at high risk for severe outcomes of COVID due to their age-related decline in immunity function, the presence of chronic conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, and lung disease. According to the World Health Organization, more than 80% of COVID-19 deaths have occurred among people aged 60 and over. When we know older adults bore the brunt of COVID, the biology of this disease means that older adults are disproportionately have fallen sick and hospitalized in the night. Americans over 65 make up 75% of the U.S. population that have accounted for three quarters of all COVID deaths. Beyond the physical health risks, older adults also face challenges in terms of their mental health, social well-being, and quality of life during the pandemic. Older adults have experienced increased loneliness and isolation as they've been forced to stay home and avoid contact with family, friends, and community. Loneliness and isolation have serious consequences for older adults as they are linked to higher rates of depression, anxiety, dementia, and mortality. More older adults have faced increases in ageism and discrimination during the pandemic as they've been stereotyped as frail and dependent. Ageism um, can undermine older adults' dignity, self-esteem, and self-purpose. Furthermore, older adults have experienced physical deterioration during the pandemic with less opportunity to engage in physical activity and exercise as well as the social connections. Physical activity is essential to older adults as it could prevent the onset of chronic disease, improve cognitive function, um, reduce falls, and enhance mood. However, due to lockdowns and the close of gyms, parks, and fear of infection, many adult, older adults have reduced physical activity levels during the pandemic. So what can we do as a community to improve the health for older adults in the pandemic? First of all, we need to recognize that older adults are not a homogenous group. They have diverse needs, preferences, abilities, and resources. We need to adopt a person-centered approach that respects autonomy, dignity, and rights. This means involving older adults in decision-making process that affect lives and listen to voices and concerns. Again, something that happens in this building a lot. Um, we need to provide accurate information and education about COVID-19 prevention and treatment options. This comes from both public health and healthcare systems that are accessible, affordable, and appropriate for the need. It also means access to vaccines and therapeutics that are safe and effective. Second, we need to address the social determinants of health that affect older adults' well-being. By addressing social determinants of health, we reduce many of the comorbidities that create uh, risks of illness in populations that are more vulnerable. We need to combat loneliness and isolation by facilitating social connections and interaction among older adults and families, friends, neighbors, and communities. Provide opportunities for participation in meaningful activities that give a sense of purpose and fulfillment. Combating ageism and raising awareness and challenge negative stereotypes about older adults. Thirdly, we need to promote physical activity among older adults as a key component of public health. Providing a safe and accessible environment that enable exercise indoors and outdoors and offer a variety of options that can cater to different interests and goals. <coughs> Ruthann and her team, as well as Brookline Can, as we've been hearing, um, do a lot of this work. We're very lucky to have them in our community. And the public health department are really enthusiastic partners in this work and bring a community approach to help address some of these challenges. One of the key approaches is our community health assessment and the community health improvement plan. This is a shameless plug for our survey, which you saw downstairs and throughout the building. Really want to thank again the team here for being a um, community champion for us and sharing information about our survey. Um, the, the second phase of the survey and the community health assessment is the community health improvement plan. And this is what will identify clear actions that take um, to address health concerns and inequalities in our community. 
It allows us to celebrate our successes. Uh, Brookline is a wonderful community with a wealth of resources, including good health outcomes. I think positive engagement and celebration are key ways to re-engage. Um, in this polarized and political landscape that we are living in, we need to provide actions that lead to positive engagement and positive change. But celebrate Brookline's achievements and look for ways to engage in positive change where we can also address um, uh, by also addressing inequalities, though, too. And before I end, I couldn't leave without giving uh, our forecast and projections for what this fall is going to look, look like. So we're looking at updates in respiratory disease projection for the fall and winter. Now, no one really has a crystal ball, and public health really struggled with this messaging over the last couple of years to really accurately describe what's going on. And I think the, the CDC director, uh, well, the former director, um, positioned it really well, where she said, you know, we're always going to follow the science, but we understand because there's something new like COVID, the science is always changing. We use the data we have right now to do the best projections, but we have in the large public health, and we'll call them CDC. So CDC has done some forecasting that I'd like to share. Um, right now they have three years of data to look back on with COVID, and unlike flu where we have decades of data, forecasting COVID and RSV are, are much more difficult. There's just not that history of data. Regarding respiratory disease, this season is likely to be similar to what we saw last fall and winter. CDC expects a moderate COVID-19 wave and a typical flu and RSV wave. Um, there is some uncertainty about the timing of the different peaks of the three illnesses. Uh, COVID will likely be similar to last year's peak timing, and the models are predicting hospitalization slightly below last winter's peak. And this is due to a large amount of immunity, both from infection and immunizations in the population. <coughs> Flu is likely to be in the typical range and could peak early. Again, this will depend on vaccine um, efficacy, um, and the timing is always variable. And RSV, now we're always looking at all three respiratory viruses as they come around this, this time of year, um, is also predicted to be in a typical range. Um, since last season, we actually saw high rates. We expect elevated population immunity due to more exposure. There was more uh, disease out there, so more people exposed, and therefore have some immunity this year. Um, the factor affecting this peak um, is really the, um, the uptake of the new vaccine for 60 and older. We need to reflect that, ask your healthcare provider about that. Um, and also for children under two. So encouraging kind of vaccine updates in those two populations. So in summary, we expect similar respiratory disease season as we saw last year, um, with a modest COVID wave and a typical flu and RSV wave. Um, as with every prediction, CDC uses the data they have at that moment and comes up with the best forecast, similar to our weather forecasts and the inputs that go into that. Sometimes they're more accurate than others, right? Um, so we, you know, we, the big public health, do um, the best job they can with the data they have at the best thing to do is to get vaccinated, know your risks, and take precautions when necessary. But as we just discussed, it's really about balancing all the activities and the health impacts. It's always a decision when you need to measure the cost benefits to your own health and health risks. So thank you for having me, and please make sure to fill out our survey and share it with all your friends and family. President and CEO of Cardenas, Cardenas. And uh, she'll come to speak a little bit more from the individual side, moving from surviving to thriving. It's a nice sort of expression. It's such a pleasure to be here at the first post COVID in person BCAN annual event. subject I'm very passionate about, which is social connection. So it's September 2023. The pandemic is officially over, and life is back to normal, right? So by a show of hands, I'd like to know, how many people do you feel that your life is back to where it was before the pandemic? Yeah, a couple, a couple. How about sort of back to where it was? How about, it's still a long way to go. These past few years have really been a uniquely challenging and traumatic time in many ways, and it was compounded by our reduced social connection. As we retreated into our homes, we isolated away from our loved ones and our usual activities, or we transitioned to working or going to school remotely. 
Now, social connection had already been declining for decades prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. A recent advisory report from Vivek Murthy, our U.S. Surgeon General, titled Our Epidemic of Loneliness and Isolation, notes that before the pandemic, about half of all U.S. adults, or 125 million people, reported experiencing measurable levels of loneliness. However, it was during the pandemic that this long-standing issue of reduced social connection came to the forefront of public consciousness, and it raised an ongoing concern as a public health concern and what we needed to do to address it. You see, it was during this time that all of us experienced loneliness and isolation in a way that we never had before. We had to postpone or cancel meaningful celebrations like birthdays, weddings, anniversaries. School and work shifted online. We were unable to visit family members, and many of us lost loved ones. We experienced feelings of anxiety, stress, fear, sadness, grief, and even anger through the loss of these moments, celebrations, and relationships. So it makes sense that this reduced social connection and or loneliness has been linked, as Sagal said, to adverse health consequences. And for many adults age 50 and older who are experiencing loneliness or isolation, the CDC notes that our health is at risk. Recent studies have found that poor social relationships are associated with a 29% increased risk for heart disease, a 32% increase, increased risk for stroke, and a 50% increased risk for dementia. Loneliness was associated with higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. So these statistics are sobering, and they point to the urgent need for all of us to reflect on the deep state of social connectedness in our own lives. The extent to which we engage with important supportive people in our lives who heighten our sense of purpose and well-being. And as we emerge from this era, building and strengthening those types of relationships offer us a promising and hopeful way forward. And it's important to remember that if you've been feeling like you'd like to increase your social connectedness, you're not alone. 125 million Americans feel the same way. So there are many, many examples of people now trying to do work in this space. In 2021, Brookline Can, along with multiple global organizations, sponsored the premiere of the documentary film All the Lonely People at the Coolidge Corner Theater. I don't know how many of you were able to attend. But it's from the filmmakers of Jen Silent, and All the Lonely People examines the impact of loneliness and isolation worldwide. Then, through a range of personal stories, director Stu Maddox and producer Joe Applebaum explored unique solutions and programs that are helping to reduce isolation in the community around the world. And I was delighted to see that at that premiere, we had over 500 people attend, both in person and online. It spoke to the importance of the issues being discussed and the desire of people to hear about ways to connect in ways that we haven't been able to do, especially during the pandemic. Now, more recently, this past spring, the Wall Street Journal had an article about a group called City Girls Who Walk that was founded by Brianne Cullen, a personal trainer in New York City. Brianne had posted a video on social media looking for women who wanted to go for a walk in Central Park. Many of her friends had left the city during the pandemic, and she was really hoping to make some new connections and also be doing something healthy at the same time. So she shared an invitation to her followers to meet her in Central Park to go for a walk. Over 250 women showed up. At times when many friendships are conducted online and loneliness from the pandemic lingers on, it was clear that these women were looking for a low tech, low cost way to engage, to meet, to talk, and to just hang out. This group has now grown to over 600 women and has helped to cultivate many new friendships and similar walking groups have been formed all across the US and in Europe. So these are just two examples of many that illustrate the strong and growing desire for conversations about these important issues and for new ways to foster relationships and to build community. So if you've been feeling like you'd like to increase your social connectedness, your social circle, what are some small steps that you can consider taking? Well, there's three that I recommend. One is to start with yourself. This begins with giving yourself a break. Consider where we are and what we've been through as a society. As individuals, we can't create changes in our social structure overnight, but we can appreciate and accept where we are and what we do have. Two, watch your thoughts. Stay positive and know that you're not alone in your desire to strengthen your social circle. 
Many people of all ages and backgrounds, just like the examples I mentioned earlier, want to build new connections and friendships. They're just not sure how or where to start, or they're shy about taking the first step. Assume people want to get to know you, and vice versa. And my third recommendation is to move from comfort to courage. Making new friends and connections as an adult can absolutely be daunting. It's hard to put yourself out there, but it's a necessary step. Be courageous and give it a try. So Marissa Franco is the author of a new book entitled Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. And she notes that making new friends and deepening long-standing relationships is possible at any age. It's essential. And Dr. Franco provides some interesting practical advice for making new friends and deepening existing relationships. She notes that it's a misconception that friendship actually happens organically. In fact, research has shown that people who think friendship happens that way, just based on luck, are actually lonelier. You really have to try to put yourself out there, and if at first you don't succeed, don't take it personally and try, try again. She notes that social connection, and I love this, that social connection is like a muscle that we need to flex, and it takes time and practice to find the right way to do so especially coming out of the pandemic. Okay, so now we know we need to start by being kinder to ourselves, to being optimistic about the collective need for social connection. We need to flex our social connection muscle, and we need to put ourselves out there, which all sounds great and it makes sense, but it still sounds a little nerve-wracking. And the question is, where do you begin? So there's a number of helpful resources that are available online and also locally. And online, I highly recommend the U.S. Surgeon General's recent 2023 advisory on the healing effects of social connection in the community. It's a lengthy document, but it's really worth reading. And in there, he outlines some actual steps that we can take to increase our social connection and ease loneliness. And there's many, many um, recommendations made, but I'd like to just name four takeaways for you to consider. One is to invest in nurturing relationships through consistent, frequent, and high-quality engagement with others, including staying close to your inner circle, your group of close friends, speaking regularly to your family members, prioritizing social connections in your calendar. It's so easy nowadays to be distracted by all the things we're doing, but when someone reaches out to you, calls you, or texts you, call them back. Make that effort to have coffee, to see them, to text them, whatever it takes to stay connected and also maintain your present social connections. Be grateful that you, for the connections that you have and nurture those relationships. Two, join a formal group that interests you. Seek out opportunities to serve or support others, either by helping your family, coworkers, friends, or strangers in your community, or participating in community service. Brookline has many opportunities to engage this way. As a matter of fact, BCAM talked about some of that that they have right now. You can sign up tonight. Um, I know the Senior Center, Ruth Ann, and the staff also have wonderful ideas. So if you're thinking, I'd like to get engaged, but I don't know how, reach out to these wonderful local resources. Another thing to consider, point number three, participate in regularly occurring social, spiritual, and or community groups that interest you, <coughs> such as a fitness group, religious organization, a group that's engaged in a hobby that you enjoy, professional or, or community service organizations, as a way to develop relationships foster a sense of belonging, meaning, and purpose, and providing an opportunity to get to know similar, some people with similar interests over time. I joined um, Brookline Rotary about a year and a half ago, and I highly recommend that group as well. 100% service-oriented, wonderful individuals, and again, a great opportunity to engage with people over time who have simple, similar interests around service. And last but not least, don't be afraid to seek help during times of struggle with loneliness or isolation by reaching out to a family member, a friend, a counselor, or a healthcare worker. I encourage you to take one of these steps this week to enhance your social connectedness. Step outside of your comfort zone, be courageous, reach out, and join something that interests you and that happens repeatedly over time. Assume people want to get to know you as you and as you begin to get to know them, ask, are you open to further connecting? I bet you'll find that the answer is yes, I am.
there's too many people for that. <laughs> Matt, there's something for both Yes, I do realize. Uh, should I give that to them? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone.